Forget the so-called official world golf rankings. No, what we need in this moment to truly determine accurately, mind you, who the best players on the planet are is someone who confused recent results with historical results, major championship performance, consistency, along with the film grind, data sets, embedding markets topped with a dash of good old subjective opinion. We need a golf world ranking czar, or at worst, a benevolent dictator for golf. That person is me, Pat Mayo. These are the unofficial world golf rankings. Welcome to the Pat Mayo Experience presented by Underdog Fantasy. Use code Mayo at Underdog Fantasy right now. Get yourself a deposit match of up to $100 plus. Code Mayo will unlock some very special Masters Week free squares for you on Underdog Fantasy. So no better time to get in the game right now than using code Mayo at UnderdogFantasy.com. For the unofficial World Golf Rankings, or the May OWGR, as I like to call them, really. That's going to be the shorthand for this, I think. I've tried to weight it in a way that makes it fair for players both playing on the PGA Tour, the Live Tour, and all tours around the world. Because even when it was just the PGA Tour, all these guys were playing multiple times a month in the same events, even then it was very hard to really gauge in the moment who the greatest players were on a head-to-head -head basis. So what this tries to contextualize is how players have done, both on the PGA Tour, in major championships, in signature events, and sometimes on Asian Tour events, DP World Tour events, Sunshine Tour events, when they've competed, trying to weight one tour against another and to see how those results could shake out. It's really an impossible task to do. There's one really easy answer to who is number one, and after that, it's a whole lot of subjectivity. But I've tried to take as much out of that as possible by creating a rubric which weights recent form as the most definitive trait that you can have. That is weighted the most in the rankings that I have done. After that, it's going to be major performance and signature event performances. Obviously, live guys do not play in the signature events. So major championships are worth more than what you do in signature events on the PGA Tour. But we're only going to look back at the past two years worth of results. You have recent form and high-end event form. And just because you win a major doesn't make you one of the best players in the world. We've seen plenty of players who are not objectively not the best players in the world win major championship. No one is out here arguing for Brian Harmon to be inside the top five of the world rankings, despite the fact that he is the guy who won the last major and is the reigning Open Championship winner of the year. But that's just not going to happen. When Jimmy Walker beat Jason Day at the 2016 PGA Championship, no one was clamoring for Jimmy Walker to be the number one player of the world over Jason Day. The number one player just happened to come in second that week. Steven Yeager, not a better player than Scotty Scheffler. Throwing that out. That's my hot take for this episode. But beyond what you do in majors and the recent form, there are a few other elements that I really truly think need to be weighted if we're going to try to talk about who the best players in the world are. Because Ludwig Oberg has never played in a major championship. Does that mean he gets zero credit for being good? No, he, obviously he's a great player. How does he fit in to this mix? So consistency needs to be involved in the rankings. Week after week, tournament after tournament, how consistently do you hit the very top end of your skills? What is your skill set? Are you Denny McCarthy and the greatest punter on the planet? Or are you someone that consistently gains most of your strokes through driving and approach? If you do that, generally speaking, you're going to rise higher up into the power ranks because that is a translatable skill that is more consistent, that leads to more high-end results and victories over time. It's just the data. That's what we've seen. The betting markets. I think the betting markets are a great way to look at this. When you log on to whatever sports book that you want to use and take a look at who the favorites in the tournament are, obviously there's a ton of hold on that. So they're not 1v1 in terms of projectability. And sometimes crowd favorites will get enhanced a little bit. But we can say that, you know, just because Jordan Spieth is the fourth favorite in a tournament doesn't mean he's the fourth best player in the world. People just like to bet on Jordan Spieth. These things we know, we can contextualize, but use some of that information to put into the rankings as well. I'm also going to try to project out some players who are players who are on an upward trend, who are some players who are on a downward trend. That is going to be factored in as well. And then 
like I said before, just the old dash of subjective opinion. Who do I personally think I would want on a Sunday trying to close a tournament? That is the last coin flip when it comes down to it. If I had two guys that are within a point un, in the rubric of each other, that's what it comes down to. You flip the coin and be like, who would I want to be backing on a Sunday? And that guy will move up higher in the power rankings. Now, I'm doing a big giveaway this week for the Masters, obviously. Now, this isn't about who is going to win the Masters. I'll have plenty of time to talk about that on the Pat Mayo experience throughout the course of the week. So here are two ways that you can get your hands on one of three cash prizes of $250 each. What you need to do is subscribe to the Mayo Media Network on YouTube. Obviously, that gets you five ballots. You want 10 ballots, you subscribe, download, rate, and review the Pat Mayo Experience on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Each of those worth 10 ballots apiece. But the big one right now is if you go to the description or just go and open the Underdog app or go to underdogfantasy.com and use code Mayo. You screenshot me that you used code Mayo and even if you've done it already, then you can screenshot that over to me as well. That is worth 30 ballots in the draw. We'll be giving away the winner live from Las Vegas when Jeff and I are there for Masters Wednesday evening live show from the Circus Swim. You can come hang with us over Masters weekend at the Circus. We're going to be at the Stadium Swim watching everything, but the ratings and review on the audio podcast are critical. If you've done it before, do it again. And boom, you get yourself re-entered into that draw and then use code Mayo at Underdog Fantasy. If you use code Mayo at Underdog Fantasy, you are eligible for two free squares during Masters Week, especially on Thursday. You can make two separate entries that gives you uh, higher or lower than Jordan Spieth, 0.5 0.5 strokes for the day. That is only for people who use code Mayo to sign up at Underdog Fantasy right now. That makes it super easy. I'm going to take uh, more than 0.5 strokes on Thursday. Boom! We got a winner right there. So there's a free square for you right now by using code Mayo at Underdog Fantasy. And the other one is going to be Scotty Scheffler over 0.5 strokes. I'm going to take the higher on 0.5. I know Scotty's great and everything. I don't think he's shooting a zero on Thursday at the Masters. So you get two opportunities to use two free squares in two separate entries, plus the deposit match that you get at Underdog Fantasy. It's a bonanza of giveaways, and you get into the draw to win an additional $250 cash. Not credits on anything. You will be wired cash if you do this. So rate and review the Pat Mayo Experience audio podcast right now. Smash the like while you're here too, because obviously... That helps. And in the comment section, I want to know who the biggest omission is from this list of the top 30. Who deserves to be inside the top 30 best golfers in the world right now that didn't make my list the unofficial world golf rankings? Let's get to number 30. 30. Shockingly, the most difficult spot to fill out in this entire list of the best golfers in the world was the very last spot because it felt like there was a definitive 29, at least in my mind. And then you had another 25 players you could build a viable argument for to be number 30. So why not reward a guy who won twice in the past eight months, including his National Open, and then in Phoenix the year after coming runner up to Scotty Scheffler when it was an elevated event, which it was not this time around. It's Nick Taylor. His approach play has been uber consistent since the calendar flipped to 2024, and he seems to have figured out the driver enough at this point, so it's no longer actively sabotaging his performance. Now, his major track record is terrible, but he's played well enough in these signature events to warrant this final spot, for the time being at least. 29. Tyrrell Hatton had probably one of the more underrated seasons ever in 2023. After starting the year with consecutive top 10s in the Middle East, he cranked out another 15 top 20s over his next 21 starts. He didn't sniff a major win, but he did have four top six finishes in signature events and top 20s at the PGA Championship and the Open Championship. And then he left for live and has become forgotten. That's not really his fault. He just happened to jump at the same time as John Rahm, and that's what we were all interested in. And since he joined Liv, he had a top 10 in his first start at Mayakoba, but has got progressively worse in every start since. 28. It's a real shame that Louis Oosthuizen didn't get an invite to Augusta National, if only because he's played so well at the tournament over the past decade and a half. But beyond that immaculate track record at the Masters, Louis played beyond Liv 
during the winter, and he picked up back-to-back -back wins in South Africa between the DP and Sunshine Tours and co-sanctioned events. And then he rolled that over into the new year with two top tens on live, including a runner-up to Neiman in Jeddah and another silver medal in an Asian tour start in Oman. He is truly the best player who is not playing at Augusta. All apologies to Taylor Gooch on that front. 27. Jordan Spieth currently can't hit an iron where he wants to. See, that's a problem when you're also kind of terrible off the tee. He does have two top 10 finishes this year, but it's because he went absolutely nuclear with his putter, which is something that Jordan Spieth does from time to time. But the rest of his game isn't good enough to capitalize and turn those hot putting weeks into wins right now. In starts where Spieth hasn't gained at least five strokes putting, his best finish is T30 at Bay Hill. It's a far cry from this time last year when he was routinely gaining eight or more strokes T to green. Spieth will always be a threat at the Masters because, as Phil and Reed proved a year ago, you don't need any form if you understand those green complexes at Augusta. But it's very difficult to see him contending at any course that puts a premium on ball striking anytime soon. 26. Tommy Fleetwood won on the DP World Tour in the Middle East to kick off the season. That was after finishing second at the DP Tour World Championship to end 2023. Then he came stateside and, I don't know, snapped all of his clubs to create more of a challenge for himself. He's been awful. He's gone through periods of poor iron play like this before, but we just haven't seen it since the end of 2021, bleeding into the start of 2022. That year, he eventually turned his game around at the Valspar. It only took one start, and then he grinded to a top 15 finish at the Masters and ended up finishing inside the top five at both the U.S. Open and Open Championship. So it's possible Tommy Ladd can get it all together, but from what we've seen so far this season, it hasn't happened yet. 25. Bryson's unique skill set of elite driving in combination with sometimes elite putting make him live to win any U.S. Open and PGA Championship. But weirdly, it kind of makes him drawing close to dead at the Masters in any Open Championship. Or any course which requires the touch and feel of a real boy. Too many uneven lies and weather conditions to calculate shot to shot at the Masters in Open Championships, and it throws his robot brain into an absolute panic. Unless the Open is at St. Andrews, which has become a bomber's track fused with putting. It's funny to think of it that way, but Bryson is a legitimate one of one. 24. After four consecutive top tens to close out the West Coast swing, the waters of Florida acted as a magnet for every Sam Burns drive. He had no finish better than T30. Statistically, he flashes elite upside off the tee every few tournaments and is still one of the game's best putters. That's undeniable. His approach play, though, has taken a nosedive over the past 18 months. It's not that it's so bad he's finishing dead last every time he tees it up, but it's an awful long way from the peaks he was hitting during the run of six wins in three years. Since the conclusion of the 2022 FedEx Cup playoff, Sam Burns has gained over four strokes on approach just once in 33 starts. It's not winning upside. 23. Once a fixture on major championship leaderboards, albeit at the bottom of the first page, not at the top, Fino doesn't have a finish better than T26 in any of his past eight majors. Now, he does have four wins, albeit against weaker fields. The 3M, Mexico, Rocket Mortgage, Houston. Yet, as the fields get stronger, his prefer... Yet, as the fields get stronger, his performance has gotten worse. And since winning his duel with John Rahm in Mexico last May, he's lost his ability to putt. The ball striking has been legitimately elite this season. Top 10 on tour elite. So if you can figure out the putting, it's possible he can ascend once again. But he's averaging losing three strokes per start over his past 10 tournaments. It is impossible to win by doing that. 22. Even when he starts out hot, Patrick Cantley has an affinity for melting down the longer he's in contention. Did you know Cantley only has one win in the past three years? Excluding a team event, because that's nonsense. And his usual consistent paychecks have vanished this year. He's lost strokes tee to green in four of his past five, resulting in just a lone top 10 in seven starts. For reference, he lost strokes tee to green just four times between 2022 and 2023. He's matched that this season. 21. It's super easy to point to a round where Justin Thomas lost seven strokes on the green and completely write him off, especially after his disastrous 2023. And you know what? You might not be wrong. That part of his game may be broken, but what is not is his approach play. So far in 2024, he is fifth 
on the PGA Tour in strokes gained approach. The driver, that's back to riding the struggle bus, but the putter simply doesn't get hot anymore. It vacillates between lukewarm and frigid, but the approach play is still the most important trait any golfer can have, as evidenced by Thomas still finishing top 12 or better in four of seven 2024 starts, despite not gaining more than a half stroke putting in any of those events. We just watched Scotty Scheffler fix his broken putter, and at his peak, Justin Thomas was a much better putter then Scotty Scheffler. So it's not inconceivable that he can get this turned around. 20. After notching his first ever top 10 in the major championship, Max Homa never finished outside of the top 10 in any other event in 2023. He even went international, post Ryder Cup, going to play the Ned Bank in South Africa and won that too. He actually started the season off pretty well with a T14 and T13 where his putter unusually failed him. And then it's like he left his ball striking somewhere on the Torrey Pines course, and no patron was kind enough to return it to the pro shop for him. His driving has been horrendous, and the irons, nothing but average. He produced some decent showings at Riv and Bay Hill, a T16, a T8, but that was propped up by gaining almost nine strokes against the field combined across those starts. He already had major issues, not with his game, but in major championships. You don't celebrate finally getting a top 10 in a major championship if you're really good at majors. And now he enters this year on his worst tee to green run since 2020. 19. You see, if golf was like baseball, Shane Lowry could just hire a designated putter and then he'd have far more than one major championship and more than one win in the USA since 2015. Because tee to green, the game is immaculate. It's among the world's best, but the putter just lets him down way too often. You can call him Discount Scheffler or Fancy Luke List in that regard. And it seems to get worse in the final rounds. Of 214 qualified players over the past three years on the PGA Tour, Lowry ranks 205th in fourth round putting, losing more than a half stroke per round in final rounds. And he still finished with 18 top 20s over that period. 18. Matt Fitzpatrick has flashed elite skills in every facet of golf. He decided to add extra distance by being a short hitter in 2022, and it paid off. It resulted in a U.S. Open win. He claimed another 11 top 10s worldwide that year and had no finish worse than T21 in any of the major championships. He went a calendar year without losing strokes off the tee after doing that. In the two years since... He's battled that same driver, which had become such a weapon, to the point where he recently discovered there was a training weight in that driver that he'd just forgotten about in Phoenix. But the extended bouts of disastrous iron player are really what has killed his results and his consistency. Fitz has gained on approach in just three of his past 14 PGA Tour starts, yet... When he flashes that iron upside, he has the innate ability to gather all of his game to peak at the same time. We saw it at Harbortown in the signature event that he won. He won the Alfred Dunhill Lynx Championship in October. We saw it then. We just saw it at the Players' Championship in his last start. It can still happen. It just doesn't happen very often. 17. Dustin Johnson was an enigma before he went to live. Now, who knows? He's basically D.B. Cooper. He ran off with the bag and... Maybe we'll see him again because he really hasn't contended truly since winning that weird off-season Masters that happened in November, which was a part of a truly historic run that he was on that year. But you just get the feeling that Dustin enjoys playing his game. He just won. He's won a few times on Live. He just won Live Las Vegas back in February. So it's not like his game is broken. He just feels like he's going to pop up at a major championship once per year and give it a run. One hole essentially crippled any chance he had to win at LA Country Club a year ago. Then he had a T6 at the old course the year before that at the Open Championship, but he was really devoid of really being in contention at the top of the leaderboard. He had no chance to win despite being on it. He still looms as a legitimate threat every time major season comes around. Now, when you back him and bet on him, you can be assured that he'll hit every fairway and hit every green, but he'll put it 45 feet from the hole and two putt for par and never really give himself a chance to score. But once a year, that putter gets rolling and he finds the right course for him. So I look forward to seeing Dustin back in our lives once a year for the next four years or so, and maybe he can get it all back together and go on one more hot run as he enters his early 40s. 16. Once a lock to find every fairway and finish in the 98th percentile of approach play in any given tournament, 
Colin Morikawa has really sputtered out of the gate in 2024. Yeah, he won in Japan to close the swing season, but something has just been truly off with Morikawa since we've left Hawaii. His putting has always been bad, but somehow it even seems worse right now. And the irons are the biggest problem. From the beginning of February through March, he lost strokes to the field on approach in three of four tournaments. That had never happened in any stretch of his career. The only other time he's lost with his irons and consecutive starts like he just did at Bay Hill in Sawgrass were the second and third starts out of the COVID restart in 2020. Something is off with Morikawa. Fortunately, he's a two-time major winner, so I have a feeling he'll be able to get it back together. Head over to Underdog Fantasy right now, get that deposit match of up to 100 bucks. But if you use code MAYO with the Masters coming up, we got some extra special bonuses for you on top of everything. If you use code MAYO right now at underdogfantasy.com, you will unlock not one, but two free squares for Masters Week. You'll get the Scotty Scheffler free square that everyone is getting higher or lower than 0.5 strokes on Thursday. However, by using code MAIL, you unlock the Jordan Spieth free square for Thursday, higher or lower than 0.5 strokes as well. Those will become available Tuesday of Masters Week, but get in now at Underdog Fantasy using code MAIL to make sure that you have the best advantages possible. 15. Sure, he might end up in someone's backyard during a round or underneath eight tree branches, but it matters not to Sahith Tagala, because he's got that magic beans that Jordan Spieth and Cam Smith have where he's just gonna miraculously scramble for power. Hell, even birdie in some of these situations. The worse it looks for him, somehow the better shot he's going to hit. But the biggest difference between Tagala and Spieth and Cam Smith is that he can actually drive the ball. The approach, well, that's a different story. His irons are either great or horrible. There's really no in between. And it's led to four top 10 so far in 2024. That is a profile in combination with a top 10 in his debut at the Masters a year ago to make him a stealth contender to win a green jacket this year. 14. It's easy to forget Cam Young is just entering his third year on the PGA Tour. We expect so much from these young players immediately that we honestly forget the players who came before them. It wasn't too long ago Scotty Scheffler was just some guy who choked away every tournament for two years before he's being compared to Tiger Woods. Same with Tony Finau, same with Will Zalatoris, same with Victor Hovland. Young has actually skipped most of the stages the others had to go through to get into the Rory McIlroy zone. He puts himself in contention so often that it seems like he gags away every tournament. He gets no credit for coming in second in these tournaments. He just gets credit for losing these tournaments and somehow that makes him seem like a worse player in the eyes of the public. When you assess this objectively, you see that Cam Young has seven second place finishes in the past two years. He has four top 10 finishes in seven major starts. That is a resume of someone who's going to win a lot. 13. The reigning champion golfer of the year, Brian Harmon, has that and a runner-up finish at a player's championship he frankly probably should have won. But what we've just seen is probably the peak of Brian Harmon's performance. It's never going to get better than this. So some could argue he could be higher on this list. I'd hear those arguments. I'd tell you, wrong, wrong. No, he's not a better player than Ludwig or Victor or Joaquin Neiman. He's just not. He's great and everything, but... His lack of distance off the tee routinely has him drawing to inside straight draws in every single tournament that are short on the PGA Tour unless his irons and putter spike on the same week, something which has happened five times in the last decade. He's just not going to win very often. He's a very good player who can be great once or twice a year. He's better than most, but he's not elite. 12. If Ludwig Oberg starts dominating at major championships his first time through them, I don't think that anyone's truly going to be surprised. He is a prospect on a level we haven't seen in a very long time. He's actually like fellow Scandinavian Victor Hovland, except he's better off the tee and on and around the greens. Victor's a better iron player. At least he was a better iron player. We'll see with Victor Hovland what's going on with his irons a little bit later on. But Ludwig has been so good in his first year as a pro, you forget that it's his first year as a pro. He broke the seal last year in Switzerland in the lead up to the Ryder Cup at the Omega European Masters. That got him on the team in Rome. He played great in Rome. And then he came back stateside and earned his maiden PGA win at the RSM Classic. Since leaving Hawaii, 
Ludwig hasn't finished any worse than T25 in any of his five starts with three top tens. And he's yet to put all four rounds together against one of these elite fields. But remember, less than a year ago, he wasn't even playing on the tour full time. Ludwig is someone most have pegged to win a major sometime in the next three years, to be the next big young player to break through. May even happen sooner than that. 11. At this time last year, well, maybe a month before this time last year, most were convinced that it was time for Will Zalatoris to break through and win a major championship. Then he sustained a back injury at the Players' Championship, and we didn't see him again till the very end of the year. I thought it would take more time for him to round back into form, but after top 10 finishes at Bay Hill and Riviera, it showed that he can continue to compete at these long, difficult courses against the very, very strongest and top-end fields that the PGA Tour can provide. And sneakily enough, no player per round in major championships has been better than Will Zalatoris the past two years. Not even Scotty Scheffler. He's missed one cut in eight major starts against six top 10 finishes. And after those consecutive top fives in the signature events, it appears like he's fully recovered. And everyone who hopped the line on Zalatoris to break through and get their first major win might need to take a step back. 10. Basically, the vision most people have in their minds of Jordan Spieth is actually what Cam Smith is. He has all-world touch around the green, he can't drive the ball for crap, and he gets so nuclear with his putter, he can just run away with any tournament that he's in, just making 40-footers from anywhere. He just needs his irons to cooperate enough in the same week. However, there has to be a question raised of, was this 2022 when he won the Open, the Players, and the Tournament of Champions in the same year? Was it just an aberration? recapitalized on a heater like Francesco Molinari did in 2019? Or was that truly a sign of long-lasting dominance? He's already won three times since he joined Live and recently had his first good showing of 2024 when he lost in a playoff in Hong Kong to Abraham Anser. But at major championships, the downside of his driver really make it difficult to see him win outside of very certain venues. Fortunately, Augusta National is one of those, and most of the open courses in the Rota are one of them, but U.S. Opens and PGA Championships, he is going to have to run so hot with the flat stick and his irons to make up for his lack of driving that, while his floor will be good in those events, is very little chance of winning. Nine. Joaquin Neiman was easily the most difficult player to rank on this list. He won three times in five starts between the DP World Tour and the Live Tour, winning the Aussie Open and two Live events. That earned him a special invite to the PGA Championship. It also got him a Masters invite from Augusta National, being one of the best players who wasn't previously in from around the world. And since then, his odds have absolutely plummeted. People every single week are coming in droves to bet on Joaquin Neiman to win at Augusta National. But maybe we pump the brakes a little bit? Winning the Aussie Open in some live events doesn't necessarily mean you're ready for major championship success. Based on recent form, it's tough to argue that he's not playing his best career golf entering this major season, hence the lofty spot in his rankings. But let's remember, this is the same player who we've been talking about for years, yet still only has one top 20 finish in 19 major championship starts. Eight. If these rankings were done at the end of 2023, there's no doubt in my mind that Victor Hovland would have been ranked inside the top three. So I can't really bump him down too far on the list if that is true. And I just said it, so obviously it has to be true. But there's just very something clearly off with the Norwegian so far this season. He fired Joe Mayo, no relation, both to me or the Seinfeld character. And since that happened, his chipping has been worse than before. And that was always fine because his ball striking was elite. However, that too has vanished. He's still gaining against the field with his driver, just only at half the rate he was last summer. But the biggest difference is on approach. Hovland gained three quarters of a stroke on approach per round in 2023. That was good for 13th on tour. He's now losing to the field on approach so far in 2024. He's 143rd on the PGA Tour in strokes gained approach. Could he flip it at any moment? Yes, that's why he's still ranked as highly as he is. But there's real cause for concern at the moment. Seven. Xander Shoffley, AKA Gagatha Christie, has a very special spot in the history 
of golf. And what he does at major championships over the next few years is really gonna tell the tale because right now he's just a guy who can't win any tournament. When the pressure gets ratcheted up, he cannot close the deal. However, if he does win, a major championship. Retroactively, all these second place finishes and fifth place finishes and fourth place finishes are going to look amazing on a resume when we're trying to say, hey, that guy was really underrated over the past 10 years. It's such a fine line. In reality, though, there are very few players who consistently play at such a high level every single week. Xander Shoffley has finished top 20 in seven straight majors. He's posted top 10s in eight of his past 11 starts coming in, and he's lost strokes tee to green once since 2002. This guy is awesome. And one major championship will completely flip his perception to the public. Kind of hope it happens for him. Six. Rory's gained the third most strokes per round at major championships of any player on the planet over the past two years. And somehow that's actually made him worse in the eyes of the public. In a way, though, it speaks to his level of play and the expectations both fans and haters have for him. When Cam Smith finishes fourth at the U.S. Open, it's a testament to he's still got it. He could still win. When Rory finishes second at the same tournament, it's evidence he's a loser who can't win. Rory's consistent presence on major leaderboards has earned him the label of choker in the past decade. And for narrative purposes, Rory would actually be better off just missing the cut every single time. If he's not going to win, his longevity and consistency have proven to be his biggest enemy. Merely having the expectation that if he doesn't win every tournament that he plays in, then he's a loser is the sole reason that he continues to be ranked so highly near the top of anyone's rankings. It's the perception because he is so good. That's why he needs to be where he is on the list. And don't forget, in a year of long shots and Scotty Scheffler winning every event, Rory McIlroy is still one of the few top-end players in the world with a win to his credit in 2024. Five. Brooks is a true outlier in these rankings. I took the rubric and threw it out as it pertains to Brooks. He could finish dead last in every live tournament throughout time, and it wouldn't make a difference as long as he continues to play his best golf in major championships. Just how it is. There are certain people that just are exceptional in life. He's kind of like your friend who's kind of a do-nothing and isn't the smartest guy in the world, but he's constantly promoted because he is so damn likable. The bosses just bring him into executive meetings because everyone else likes him, and then deals get done because of it. He actually turns out to be really good at the role, and he lived up to the billing in 2023 with a win, a second, 17th, and 64th across the four majors. If he has a mediocre run at the Masters and the PGA Championship, then of course he'll tumble down the rankings a little bit, but until that happens, he needs to be inside the top five. Four. Whatever issue Hideki had with his driver in 2023, that problem is solved, and boom! Just like that, he's back in the winner's circle for the first time in two years. Look, Hideki's always going to be an inconsistent putter. A lot of the best players in the world are wildly inconsistent putters. But he's routinely gaining against the field off the tee, and he's mixing in spike weeks with his putter again. That's a lethal match for a player who's so good with his irons and has an all-world short game. And he played C-minus golf a year ago, and he still managed to finish no worse than T32 in any major. And with a win in three top tens entering Augusta, he is on the very short list of the players who can knock off Scotty Scheffler and claim his second green jacket. Three. Since extra credit is being doled out to players who play their best in the biggest events, although this is hard to say because it doesn't match what I've seen over the past five years minus the last year, Wyndham Clark is the best player over the past 12 months whose name is not Scotty Scheffler. It's, it's not even close. He's won two signature events and a major championship and comes second at the players and another signature event. He was even third at the tour championship just for fun, too. It's quite a rise in play from a guy that didn't even qualify for the match play a year ago. RIP match play. And he was forced to tee it up in the alternate event in the Dominican Republic. He's never competed for a green jacket yet. Here he is, Windy C, near the very top of the best players in the world. Two. John Rahm's current form really speaks to the difficulty of how do you incorporate live results into the rubric to try to churn out who the best players in the world are. Because John Rahm's run from the beginning of 2023, January 2023, starting at the Tournament of Champions, through his win at Augusta National, 
is about on par, if not better, than what Scotty Scheffler is currently doing amongst the all-time great runs. But he's just not at that level anymore. Fortunately for John Rahm, in these rankings, knowing, just knowing, he has the potential to reach that level, buys him an awful lot of time near the top of this list. Post donning sports' highest sartorial honor a year ago, Rahm hasn't won on any tour across the world. He got outrun by Tony Finau in Mexico and backdoored a second place finish at the Open because of a great Sunday, but was never in contention to win any major after the Masters. And since joining Liv, the results on a spreadsheet look great. He has a top 10 finish in every single start, but he's been leading, going down the stretch in the final round on Liv multiple times and walked away with zero wins. If that continues and he doesn't perform at the major championships, he will finally lose his spot near the top of this list. But for now, he's just too damn good. One. Scotty Scheffler is the only player on this list whose ranking comes without any dispute. Even the live bots agree. Scotty Scheffler is currently the best player walking the planet at the game of golf. And despite his inability to consistently make five foot putts, he is on a historic run right now. Over the past 18 months, peak Tiger excluded, He's only been matched by career best runs from Vijay Singh, David Duval, and Ernie Els. And yeah, he's only claimed one major championship in the past two seasons. However, he's come second twice and third over those eight events. And since the calendar flipped to 2023, get this, Scheffler has made 27 total starts, posted four wins, 21 top tens, and hasn't missed a cut. His worst finish over that run is a T31 at the FedEx St. Jude Classic to kick off the FedEx Cup playoffs last year. A T31. And that will do it on the Pat Mayo Experience for the first ever unofficial World Golf Rankings. As I asked you before, comment down in the comment section, of course, or at me, at the PME on X, who the biggest omission was from this list or the most egregious ranking in your mind. I bet you you think it's Hideki. That's sort of the pushback that I've got. I'll have a follow-up show tomorrow about this with Stephen Hennessy and Chris Powers from Golf Digest, where my column will be living. We walked through it as well as I kind of went on the defensive and defended all of these rankings to see how we finally got to the final numbers. And full disclosure, Shane Lowry was originally number 29, and I talked myself into a frenzy so much. I was like, I got this guy too low, based on the arguments that I had made for some of the other people. I tried to make this as consistent as possible, obviously not one person is going to agree with every single one of the rankings that I made. But that's the fun of doing all of this stuff. And I hopefully provided a snapshot, which is reflective of what is happening in golf now and how we perceive a lot of these players based on the key metrics that I pointed out. I try to keep it consistent in that sense and try to really take my own personal opinion out of it as evidenced by Siwoo Kim not being on this list. Although if he had just performed a little bit better at any major ever, that he probably would have found his way on this. Because it's Tita Green game right now. Sharp, by the way, for old C. Woo! Kim, smash a like while you're here. Sub to the channel. That'll get you five ballots in the draw. Ten ballots apiece by subscribing, rating, and reviewing. Five stars, the Pat Mayo Experience audio podcast. Ten ballots for Apple. Ten ballots for Spotify. Sub to the free newsletter. That will get you 15 ballots. And then, obviously, the big one. The one where you can really game change yourself and stuff the ballot box. Use code Mayo at Underdog Fantasy right now. Get yourself a match deposit of up to $100. And using code Mayo will unlock you an extra free square during Masters Week. You'll get the Scotty Scheffler one. That one's easy. But by using code Mayo, you'll get the Jordan Spieth one as well. You can't use them together in the same entry. But... But that means you just get a free square in two entries to try to increase the amount of money that you can win on Underdog during the Masters. All right, we have so many master shows coming out. So stick on Mayo Media Network. Stick with the Pat Mayo Experience. And I will see you next time. Pat Mayo Experience! Experience!